So let's get into this case study. You're dispatched to a local apartment complex for a 50-year-old man with difficulty in breathing. You find a patient sitting on the stairs of the second floor, clutching his chest and holding his inhaler. He has a GCS of 456. His airway is patent, but he's short of breath, speaking in two to three word dyspnea. His skin is pink, warm, dry, and overall he's just globally weak. Was having a difficult time, couldn't make it all the way up the stairs. You notice around he is holding his inhaler and, and he was just walking up the stairs, couldn't make it. It just became very weak, short of breath, and couldn't go anymore. So heart rate's 82 on the monitor. You notice the irregular, irregular rhythm, AFib at average rate of about 82. He's 86% on room air. BP is 138 over 86. He's afebrile and blood glucose is normal. He's having difficulty breathing again with those two to three word dyspnea. Uh, I said while he's going up the stairs, he had some what was described as angina, but he said with rest, he's now at a zero out of 10, experiencing no chest pain at this time. His upper lobes are clear and equal, but you do notice some rails diffuse in the lower lobes. His abdomen is soft, pliable, symmetric, and non-tender. He has a history of hyperlipidemia, hypertension, asthma, and he has no known drug allergies, and he states that he is compliant with all of his prescriptions. So you're asked, what is your differential diagnosis? What additional assessments would you perform? And overall, what is your plan of care? So let's get into it. So we start coming up some, with some things in that differential diagnosis. So we go to, well, the shorter breath. So let's start with that respiratory cluster of, well, maybe it's a PE, COPD, CHF. So with COPD, you know, most generally that it's emphysema or it's bronchitis. So they're going to develop most generally wheezing or they're really having issues with gas exchange in the emphysema. And that's going to be known in a general history. Okay. So we didn't present with any wheezing. Uh, yeah, they do have a history of asthma, but not describing anything that they're on. You know, they're the only uh, respiratory medications they're on was that inhaler. So kind of asthma is the only thing that really leads us there. And with no wheezing, um, no known history with gas exchange, um, you know, they didn't really present as that blue bloater or the pink puffer. So we're kind of ruling out this time COPD. Uh, with a PE, yeah, they're, they're short of breath. Uh, we did first notice that they're hypoxic with clear breath sounds, but then we noticed we got to the lower lobes and there was some edema, so some rails that we noted. Well, that can be a, a later sign of a PE, but that was noted on both sides of the lungs. Most generally, that PE is going to affect one side of the lung, okay, or just one individual lung. So we're kind of ruling that one out. Uh, and then we start, well, they're hypoxic, short of breath. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's anemia. Maybe there's just not enough hemoglobin in there to be transporting all the oxygen. But we have no known history, no uh, suspicion of any type of reason we'd have blood loss or lack of blood cells. So we're kind of ruling that out. Plus in anemia, if it were there, they may not necessarily be hypoxic. You're going to have that false positive to where um, you might show 100% on that pulse ox, but there's just not that many blood cells to carry enough oxygen. So the concentration of oxygen throughout the bloodstream is actually low. Okay, so we're kind of left with MI and CHF. Well, those two things can kind of go hand in hand. Well, we started thinking, well, maybe, maybe it was that MI. They were having that chest pain, but it's went away with rest. So they're experiencing stable angina. So with rest, without really any intervention other than rest, the chest pain has went away. So not really presenting with those classic signs. Still nothing we could a thousand percent rule out, but symptomatically we're kind of crossing that out. So then that kind of leaves us with CHF being one of those big culprits 
that does produce pulmonary edema based on the overall congestion within that heart. So here's what's going on. In a normal heart, that left ventricle, big muscle, really strong. So the myocardium, its job is to squeeze really hard to circulate blood throughout the entire body. Okay, so you got a big ventricle over here, job is this full systemic circulation. Well, in a congested heart, it becomes overfilled. So by overfilled and that pericardium, that outlying sac on the heart, pretty much makes the heart maintain a shape. So that left ventricle becomes pressurized, weak, starts to develop atrophy, and just gets a lot weaker. Okay, so we have that left-sided heart failure going on there. So there's some underlying cause for that. So coronary artery disease. If you know the myocardium is just not perfusing as well as it normally should, it's inevitably going to start losing its ability to function as well as it should. Uh, from that MI, you know, again, if it is an overall infarcted tissue to where it's not perfusing, it's going to cause death of that myocardial tissue. Chronic kidney disease, as you know, the kidneys play a main component in managing blood pressure. So if the kidneys become damaged, start maintaining uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension leads into myocardial damage as well. Uh, diabetes kind of a cascade tying in with that kidney disease. So if diabetes is bad, it's going to start affecting the kidneys, affecting the ability to regulate blood pressure. And then cardiomyopathy, just something has caused damage to that myocardium. And then genetics, you know, genetics play a lot into coronary artery disease, hyperlipidemia, uh, and sometimes they're just congenital heart defects that is no fault of the patient. So some symptoms we will see is edema. So yeah, in this situation, we have pulmonary edema, which is caused by that left-sided heart failure. Shortness of breath on exertion, the blood flow and the overall perfusion as needed just can't keep up when that patient is exerting force, putting their heart under strain. So the heart needs a bunch of oxygen, so that oxygen demand is increased, and if the heart just can't keep up, everything kind of starts to fail. Uh, orthopnea, so that positional. So if the fluid is sitting at the bottom of the lungs, they try to lay down flat, like in a proximal nocturnal dyspnea, they're trying to lay flat, they can't do it, or at nighttime and everything is relaxing, it gets much worse at night, or while laying down, because the flu at the bottom of the lungs, as it goes and lays down, it spreads and kind of covers a large surface of the lungs. Weight gain from sometimes fluid retention or just overall weakness in developing kind of a, a sedentary lifestyle, secondary to that overall weakness and just global fatigue. All right, so if in the left side of the heart, the blood is returning in from the lungs into that left side. Okay, so if this left ventricle is starting to fail and it's not able to eject blood out, it's going to make that blood start to back up. So as that blood starts to back up, that's going to start developing uh, excessive fluid into the capillary beds and that's where it's going to start to leak out. So when it backs up, first capillary bed it's finding is within the lungs. Okay, so left side of the heart starts to fail, it's going to develop pulmonary edema. And just the opposite, you know, if it's coming from the extremities, that returns into the right side of the heart. So if the right side of the heart is unable to perfuse stuff over to the right side, okay, so if the left side of the heart starts to fail, stuff in the lungs is becoming backed up. And so if it's backed up, everything trying to leave the right side of the heart into the lungs starts to back up. So the right side of the heart can't push any blood over because the line's already backed up into the left side. So then that starts to make blood back up this way. So it starts to back up this way. That's where it's going to find those weak capillary beds in the furthest extremities from the heart. So starting in the feet, then not in the hands, and then developing global edema. So pedal edema is going to be your first uh, location where that fluid is going to start to build up. So within those tissues, what we're going to be experiencing is if there is a, black, a backup and a congestion of blood flow, it's going to just start to leak through those capillary beds into the tissue. 
So again, right-sided heart failure is going to go to our furthest part away. Furthest part away from our heart is the feet. Next furthest away is going to be out to the hands. And then in pulmonary edema, again, a fluid starts to shift out of those capillaries. And, you know, the blood flows coming out of that heart are returning to the heart from both sets of lungs and that left side. So as it starts to back up, it's going to go to both sides of the lungs pretty much equally. And then it's going to settle at the bases. So standing up, not as much lung surface covered, but if you go lay them down flat, that fluid is going to start shifting and then cover a whole surface of the lung. So if you're laying on the back, that fluid could go and shift around and be covering the entire posterior region of the lungs, hence why it's so hard for them to breathe laying down. All right, so here's how we're going to treat these CHF patients. Shortest breath, beginning with oxygen. Okay, so they're in significant distress, so that's going to be non breather 12 to 15 liters per minute. We would want to, you know, think about a nasal cannula route. That's for supplemental. If the patient basically has to tell us their shorter breath, that we're not seeing distress or speaking in full sentences, rates fine, volumes fine, just to supplement, maybe oxygen. They're always on. That's where nasal cannula would come in at, you know, two to six liters a minute. But here's where we want to be. So starting with some high flow oxygen, non rebreather. That's helping with. Um, overall oxygenation in the lungs and just a little bit of peep as well. Now, if they're at the point where they're significantly distressed, then we can be going to CPAP right away. Okay, so if they're very fatigued, just seem like that diaphragm is really weak, that needs a little bit of a oomph to push it in, we can be going to CPAP. We just got to think about the basic things that would be a contraindication for uh, CPAP, such as all mental status, hypotension, and, you know, essentially trauma to the chest or abdomen, and able to maintain their own respiratory drive. So they have to be able to initiate their own breath for CPAP to work. So quickly, we can begin our assessment to focus, hey, we need CPAP. Let's make sure that we don't have any contraindications before we start. So able to treat quickly there. Okay, so we've done a CPAP. It's now assisting with a lot more PEEP pressure. Okay, because what's going on? You see CPAP, it's increasing PEEP within the alveolar space. So PEEP is up, and it's basically starting to push against the fluid that's built up in those alveoli, because that fluid has shifted and come out of the vascular space. So CPAP is going to stretch out that alveoli, more surface area for gas to exchange, and increases alveolar pressure to help get some of this fluid back into the vascular side. Now, if we need more assistance, say we've done CPAP, you know, starting out at three to five centimeters of water, and we generally don't want to go any more than 10. So we've put on CPAP, we have a regulated pressure, and we've reevaluated that the patient is not hypotensive then we can begin thinking about nitro to help lower the pressure on the vascular side. Because this is all very much a game of pressure. So we've increased alveolar pressure to kind of push back against the fluid that's come into that space. And if we open up the vascular side, it basically gives more space for that volume to get back into. And then again, that game of pressure. So if I'm CPAP and I'm pushing and I need a little bit more oomph, Maybe necessary instead of cranking the pressure up, we can, whatever I'm pushing against, make it less pressure. CPAP will do its job easier. Okay, so we'll put CPAP on, make sure the blood pressure has stabilized because you know this inevitably is going to lower the blood pressure also. So we don't want to just throw CPAP on a nitro all at once and then tank a blood pressure. Okay, so we'll start out here, standardize the pressure, regulate it, maybe if we get three to five, and that's great amount of improvement they need just a little bit more then we can consider just titrating this pressure a little bit to assist but if we're still having significant issues with fluid then we can begin thinking about adding this in once we make sure our blood pressure is stabilized from what the CPAP is going to cause 
so we think overall timeline. You know, right off the bat, we can begin with oxygenation. You know, there's no contraindications for oxygenating that patient who's in significant distress. So given oxygen right away and then thrown on CPAP. Okay, so again, we just do this quick assessments. And once we do a quick assessment, then we can begin with that CPAP. And then, you know, make sure our blood pressure and everything is okay in here. And then we can throw in some nitro. So nitro is just going to help the work that the CPAP is doing. It's not going to relieve it all on its own. So CPAP with supplemental nitrates to assist in that pressure. And then we get down here to Lasix. Okay, so Lasix in pre-hospital is kind of losing some popularity, mostly due to the issues of the renal system. Okay, so the way that Lasix works is it is an osmotic diuretic, meaning that the kidney's gonna go and be pulling fluid out of the bloodstream, putting it in our urinary tract for us to excrete it. But we know that, as we discussed earlier, that kidney failure can cause can, can cause the pulmonary edema. So we need to make sure that there's no suspicion of renal impairment before we're giving Lasix. Okay, so ideally, the patients are going to be given Lasix. They're going to be the ones that, hey, I've, I've been out of my Lasix, haven't taken it in a while. Um, once we're going to kind of supplement that. And then we also think about onset of action. It's roughly 45 minutes for that diuresis to start to happen. So the effect of it is way long-term down the road. Also in a lot of emergency medicine now, they're not given Lasix like they once did. Most physicians now, or a lot of physicians I should say, are making sure they do a renal function test to make sure kidneys are functioning appropriately before they want to give something that's gonna be quite evasive on those kidneys. Okay, so our main staple in pre-hospital medicine is oxygenate, Quickly assess to see if we can put on CPAP, give CPAP. If CPAP's not doing quite the job and our blood pressure is still okay, then we give a nitrates to, to lower that vascular pressure side so our alveolar pressure can help stretch out, create more surface area, get some of the fluid out of the alveolar space into the vascular system and out to the hospital. So thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you're able to pull some stuff out about congestive heart failure. Just remember that congestion is going to cause fluid to back up whichever side of the heart has failed. So pulmonary edema side, mostly the emergency we're going to see from that atrophy of that left ventricle, engorging of the left ventricle, fluid backing up into the lungs, and then that fluid shifts out of the vascular space into that alveolar space. So oxygenation, CPAP, making sure you know pressures are good for all that, pressure sustains good supplementing with nitrates you know so create gas exchange space in the alveoli p pressure lower the vascular pressure side so that fluid has some place to go and that the cpap pressure wins thanks everybody